Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 239th New Social Environment. I'm Cal McKeever, the curatorial assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Jason Moran and Fong H. Bui. We're thrilled to have the poet musician Janice Lowe here, who will read today's who will read to close today's program. We'd like to thank our friends at Luring Augustine for supporting today's conversation. You can find more about Jason Moran's exhibition on their website through the links in the chat. To begin, I ask you in joining me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenin Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lahadnafoig, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Gremifels, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And acknowledge that justice will come from the streets and from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host and guest. Fong Bui is an artist, writer, independent curator, publisher, and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. Jazz pianist, composer, and performance artist Jason Moran is the artistic director for jazz at the, at the Kennedy Center. He currently teaches at the New England Conservatory and was a 2010 recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship. Moran is deeply invested in uh, reassessing and complicating the relationship between music and language, and his extensive efforts in composition, improvisation, and performance are all geared towards challenging the status quo while respecting the accomplishments of his predecessors. Fong, take it away. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being hey, here. Fong. Yes, thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Uh, it's very nice to have everyone here in unusual timing. Usually we, uh, you know, we welcome our friends at always at 1 p.m., but we are capable of being flexible. So therefore we are 3 p.m. Today is Monday, so it's terrific. As I, as Jason spoke the other day, um, this conversation is really dedicated to the recent passing of our friend, Milford Graves, the true visionary interdisciplinary artist, if we ever seen one. Milford was a true human syncretist to whom music, be it jazz or other form of music, art and science, to medicine, I don't know, to martial arts. He and I spoke about Bruce Lee and all the obscure uh, Kung Fu artists from Hong Kong once, that lasted for like an hour and a half. It's amazing. He was in, had deep interest in esoteric philosophy and wherever that was, you know, they were equally integrated into his life as a whole. Such organic coalescences of disciplines are exactly what we trying to cultivate and celebrate here at the rail. I should begin now, even though I should share with you that I'm aware of Jason's work first through his collaboration with our mutual friend, the great artist John Jonas, in their powerful piece, The Shape, the Sense, and the Feel of Things at Dear Beacon in the Basement. I remember it was 2005, inspired by the remarkable life and work of art historian Abby Warber. Then it was a year later that our former music editor, Dave Mendel, who told me to listen to Jason's third album, The Bandwagon which are a proud breaking indeed, but I didn't get to meet Jason until the two of the real beloved and brilliant comrades, our music editor, George Grella, and the consultant editor, Raymond Foyle, who brought Henry Threadgill and Jason to my home in Greenpoint, Brooklyn for an in-depth in interview, followed by an order in type dinner with Henry sharing with us amazing life, his life, 
including the, the rock band that he formed while he was in, uh, in the army station in Hue, where I was born in the height of the Vietnam War in 1968. That went on for a long time, you can imagine. Then later in the following summer, I met Jason along with his exceptional wife partner, uh, Alicia Holmeran and their twin sons, Malcolm and Jonas and, at Kippy Camp in Acadia, Maine. In any case, I'm sure you all know this, as I know, there are people who you meet in this world, regardless of how often you see them, or you would see them very seldomly due to some you know, mysterious reason or circumstances, or regardless of when in fact you meet them, however early or later in life, only a handful of them, you, you would call your soulmate, your comrade, your brother or sister in arms, or, or as our friend Robert Stoll would say it, brother and sister in arms and harms. <laughs> in any case, recently I would, in my case, I would include Julie Moretto, who I call Sister Julie, by the way, she sent her love to you, Jason. And I would call, you know, Jason, brother Jason. So, so welcome brother Jason and congratulations on your recent show at Learn Augustine. Oh, thank you. And, and a real pleasure to talk with you again as all of these conversations are full of uh, lots of left turns and deep dives and, you know, astral projection. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much sure. Uh, we do it too early, so we can't have any drink or anything like that. <laughs> it's not a cocktail situation here. But, you know, uh, there's been hundreds of interviews, Jason. I only got through maybe, you know, 80% of them. It covers such a great deal of your artistic formation, your remarkable collaboration with countless musicians and artists alike. I mean, it's, 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 I can't keep up with it, you mm. know? So what I thought is that maybe I would, would you know, repeat some of the question being asked only to pose it in with a slight revision and then mm. maybe with a few new ones mm. that I thought perhaps we can share with our friends here. Yes. Uh, let me begin first, how gratif gratifying it was for me to read, read your conversation with George, with Raymond, and Henry, especially how you and Henry spoke of jazz ancestry and the need to engage that tradition in ways that are global, unsentimental, and definitely unorthodox and everything else but a linear path, you know? The mm. secret is, I don't know if it is secret, but maybe we call it a secret, is that is maybe having a certain capacity of deep love, deep appreciation, and knowledge of all music, be it Monteverdi, Bach, Schumann, Brahms, Debussy, Alban Bearer, or being Fast Waller, be it Duke Hellington, Charlie Parker, Coltrane, mm -hmm. Billy Holiday, uh, mm -hmm. Tilonis Monk, that's your, one of your most favorite player. And also th there's Robert Johnson, there's Memphis Mini, Muddy Waters, Big Mama Thornton and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is your, the, the, your secret of a productive, and immersive life mm. that you're able somehow to collaborate with different magicians from different generations, yeah. be it Don Byron, Cassandra yeah. Wilson, um, yeah. Otis Taylor, Char Floyd, and recently, of course, our, our great friend just passed, Milford Graves. Right. So the first question is where, when, and how did this? capacity, this alchemy, or so I say, aptitude, or stamina, or <laughs> syncretism, <laughs> you know, creative life come from, where all, where it all began? I mean, I might say I'm restless, um, but I think you brought up a really interesting word when you, you, like, when you said secret, and none of the people you mentioned, I'm sure they do keep secrets, because we all do, but mm -hmm. they don't keep the secret in their music. They really like lay it firmly within it. And that's what makes you listen harder to it or makes me listen harder to it. Yeah. When we talk about Billie Holiday, the way she can slur a word, you know, it's Ooh. not simply the word she's saying anymore. It's something else. Uh, the way Robert Johnson, he's a poet, you know, uh, the way he, 
the way he talks about blues fall down like hail, you know, mm -hmm. they don't keep secrets. And I think for black music, it has been a place because it's invisible that you can actually plant more. Um, and also, and I really also really mean an instrumental black music uh, without a lyric, uh, the way that the code lives in that music that I kind of have grown up on. And I don't know, I felt, you know, growing up in Houston, Texas, part of what we hear is the myth of my neighborhood, Third Ward, is like a lightning Hopkins comes from that neighborhood. Yeah. He makes his music about it. When he writes about a dog barking around the corner, there is street dogs all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so that lets you know where you are, where the music is. And I felt like that was honest to, to them as a generation of creative folks. And that it was important to share that not only for the other black communities across the country, let alone across the globe, how people can start to see it, uh, uh, an angle or a shade or a dimension of the life that unfortunately television really tries to flatten. Yeah. That music somehow breathes a dimension that when it comes out of the speakers and hits your body, mm -hmm. really good music impacts you forever. And so I honor the bravery of those musicians not being secretive about their passion for making sound. Mm -hmm. And it's the thing that drives me as a teacher, as a player, as a researcher, as a collaborator. Mm -hmm. But when still, I mean, it, all right, there's no secret to, to how they wrote the music, the rhythm, the, the lyrics, obviously, absolutely complete poetry. I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm so invested in Delta Blues, so I know those mm. musicians very deeply. Um, but still, uh, you began playing piano at such a young age, Jason, encouraged by an amazing uh, supported family. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember a particular instant in your childhood that, that the prospect of having music as a vocation would provide you an opportunity to mediate life experience among everything else that live above, below, or in between. <laughs> Side. Yeah, that's good. I mean, as a child, no. I mean, but I'll say this though: my um, my family is extremely supportive. So my parents took us to see not only music, to see dance, to see art. You know, to be in the community, to go see Bobby Seale give a lecture. You know. Like it was really like, no, you, you're gonna know all the culture and uh, of this neighborhood. And so that is one thing. And all of my aunts and cousins and uncles and grandparents, they're all the same way, mm. the way that it's all folded in. So I have like a real support system around that. Um, and they wanna hear the music too, whatever, whatever stage I was at, I had to perform it. Um, but I think, you know, once, but I didn't understand it as a, as a, as a lifestyle. My father had a cousin, has a cousin named Tony Lorenz and his brother, Mike Lorenz, they lived in Chicago and they played the blues. They played with Albert King. And when they came to Houston, they would come over our house and Tony Lorenz would sit at the piano. And I kind of was like, oh, that's a good example of the kind of fun you're supposed to have at the piano. But I didn't know how he like lived his life. I think a teenager doesn't care about how somebody makes their living. At least I wasn't caring how they and what was a bill to pay. I don't even understand any of that. Um, but when I got to Manhattan School of Music, moving up here to New York, I also was still unsure, even though I was studying music, how do you make a living as a musician? Mm -hmm. I just didn't understand it. And I wasn't even sure that that was actually something wise to do. And I had friends who were in school with me who really who really convinced me that I should continue to become a musician or stay in school. Actually, they didn't care, give a shit if I became a musician. They just more, they cared that you're not, nah, you're pretty good. You should stay, you shouldn't leave. And I'm thankful to those friends to this day um, because it, it's, you know, America doesn't really t say that it wants artists mm -hmm. <laughs> in the community, you know? And so it doesn't say like, that's something you can be. Um, and you might see examples of, but I need like, I mean, unfortunately, much probably like other people, but I need constant confirmation of an idea. Mm -hmm. But, and from, from very, very different places that it's something that probably you can move forward with. So becoming a musician, moving to New York, I thought was the first step. Making it from month to month, I thought would be the second step, yeah. you know? And, um, but fortunately I was studying with 
brilliant people, uh, real historians of the music and activators of the language that gave me something that I, I would use all the way up until this day, a kind of a leverage for the future. Well, you, you were very aware of uh, Jackie Bear. So, I mean, Bayer, you, yeah. You, yeah. you came to New York to study with him. Yeah. So you were aware of, of his immense uh, music. Yeah, I mean, he's the piano player who's playing with Charles Mingus, you know. They're being the activists out there on the road. They're taking the Negro National Anthem all the way to Europe. They're playing it in Oslo. They're playing it in, in, uh, in Copenhagen. They're playing it in Berlin. Like, they're playing the music. They're bringing the struggle to the other stages. Yeah. Um, so that, that it, to amplify the movement. So they were using those songs in a kind of restless approach to freedom. Uh, and that band, I was like, wait, that guy teaches? I should just sit with him forever um, mm -hmm. to learn what it's like to make a music that vital, uh, to create a language that bold. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it turned out to be the best decision I, I'd probably ever make was moving to New York to study with Jackie Byard. Yeah, I mean, I seen him playing several times at Village Vanguard and elsewhere in the mm -hmm. 80s, late 80s, mm -hmm. when I came to New York. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the great things you can say about him, his greatest attribute was a player. I don't know about him as a teacher, mm -hmm. but I know that he had a very particular style of playing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember, I'm paraphrasing John, uh, Wilson, the, the New York Times critic, he's saying that, that he had to create a me melodic language that nimble between Art Tatum's fingering movement mm -hmm. and Pat's, Pat's Waller's stride. Mm -hmm. And also he used the word very particular, which I feel very identifiable to Thelonious Monk phrases, which is prickly. Dissonances. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, he must have been a remarkable teacher too. As Unbelievable. You know, like there are certain great teachers who don't finger wag at you. Yeah. They just tell you what it is. You know, I mean, he would tell me what it was like being in World War II and being mm -hmm. in the army band, you know, and right. knowing other musicians in the band across another boat away, you know, like um, playing to each other as they're on the boat, you know. Um, you talk about the danger of that. I, you know, my generation, I don't know, it's whatever it, we are, but we're not that. And um, I, I think there was also just a, a what he saw in at with his approach to the piano was that it was the pathway to everything. And he didn't care what dialect it was, he could find it on the piano, you know, so he used it really as like passport. And yeah. uh, so he could blend styles kind of really rapidly and fluidly in a way that most people would regard as, oh, you're shifting the genre. But he was like, nah, it's just, it's all open. So you have to find a way that you want to put it together. Right. Um, you know, we were talking about the, the way in which some of us have immense admiration and respect for the elderly. Mm -hmm. I think just the other day I was sharing with you, you know, and Carl, when my family came to, to the US, we landed in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, <laughs> where it's mm -hmm. nothing but white and deer, you know, white people and deer, but <laughs> we were brought to the mall, the biggest mm -hmm. mall in, in Pennsylvania. It's, I think it's called Woodhaven Mall, and how my parents were so horrified in seeing older American men would, you know, in his 70s, would dressed up like a, a teenager with a baseball cap, with, with t shirt and short and sneaker, and the woman would do the same, you know. And it's the opposite of how I was brought up. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't wait until you get older because the older you become, the greater adoration and wisdom you gain and everyone want to see you, mm -hmm. you know, come by. So I, I have the feeling for some reason, I don't know when exactly, but you have that similar sense, Jason, you know, that, that somehow the, you know, the, the, that like, like T.S. Eliot, um, classic uh, essay, it's called Tradition and Individual Talent. A friend of mine and I just reread it actually, where he said the dead writers are remote from us because we know so much more than they did. But, but yes, precisely because of they, that, that of they are that which we know, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, so all that accumulation is supposed to be a living organism. You know, mm-hmm. your access to, to past musician, to history, and all that. The way that you describe a Bayer ability to blend mm-hmm. all of these things into the way he play. Mm-hmm. So, do you think that it began in New York, or it already had roots? Well, no, it, it definitely also. began in Houston. My, you know, my, we went over my mother's, my grandmother's house, my mother's mother. Ah. we went over her house every Sunday. And, and my grandmother was a caterer in Houston and for white and black families. So, you know, when you think about catering, Southern catering, there's just all these other kinds of codes about whose house you're going into and what door do you go through and how do you dress and how do you talk and all that. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother made all of her grandchildren work with her. So serve, you know, serve stuff and stand at the punch bowl and, you know, deliver things and, um so we had a understanding of what it meant to simply survive uh, mm-hmm. but also what it meant to nourish uh from my grandmother uh Benny Chester is her name and you know so I, I cherished that part and also cherished my father's relationship to his parents um yeah. and so when I left Houston you know moving to a city where you don't have any family moving here to New York I kind of, of course, I'm still looking for that. And I'd say that I found it in my teachers and slowly they would pass away. Jackie Bayard, Andrew Hill passed, you know, um, early 2000s and the late 90s. And when my mother passed, you know, even in 2004, um, it was at the exact same pivot point of meeting um, Adrian Piper and Joan Jonas at the same time. Now, Joan and Adrian may not ever really think about how they showed up in my life. And you talked about this earlier about when people who come into your life at a moment, you know, and what it means and the gravity yeah. of meeting someone who doesn't necessarily say they're going to take care of you when they show when you show up, but they end up taking care of you. And at that moment, being married to Alicia, meeting Joan and Adrian just helped click some things into gear about what it meant to be a musician that I think beforehand I was making music that I thought was good and I still think it's good but I think there was a shift conceptually that coming into contact with them just I couldn't use the same tactics that I used before after working and knowing their work Mm -hmm. and and it really started you know another 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 lane yeah, but the ability to absorb all of that um, is fairly uncanny, you know, Jason. There's a mm-hmm. lot of of how we are shaped into becoming more singular in what we do. Mm-hmm. The kind of uh, what Isaiah Willing called the hedgehog-like temperament, you know, mm-hmm. where the fox to whom the world cannot be boiled down in one activities, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that remarkable in the sense because that's what we learn about Joan Jonas so much. We admire mm-hmm. Joan so much because Joan um, somehow, some point in her life, uh, basically wherever the decade of the 70s or the previous late 60s thrown away to pare down the language to minimalism, you know? Mm-hmm. She just brought everything back. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's remarkable for us, but... Um, can we now maybe begin with the slides, uh, some mm-hmm. images to share with everyone, Carl, and while we continue talking? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I thought beginning with uh, this painting, partly, Jason, uh, it was your uncle um, who essentially, you know, told your father or parents to buy this painting, because he was a, Rosette Moran was his name, you told me. Mm-hmm. He was a student, John T. Biggers, uh, who was teaching at Texas Southern University, mm-hmm. and who I met once through Jack Witten in nice. 2001 or two, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this painting is a very famous painting. It's called Shotguns, which is the typical 12 feet wide, you know, houses mostly uh, built in the South after the Civil War throughout the, the 20 and 30. Mm-hmm. And, and what is so remarkable about this painting, you talk a great deal growing up seeing them. And I know that you, you say several times been loaned to various shows from different museums. 
Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you, do you, I mean, for me, look at this painting just the other day, I realized oh, that the over, overall symmetry in repetition mm -hmm. um, and the five female figures, almost like goddesses standing mm -hmm. tall with such dignity, with such grace, as though they are a proud protector of the community behind them. Yes, everything you just said, you know, and the paint, I, I, the paint, I, I yeah. moved it, but, but do you see an equivalent somehow? Of course, you know, I, you know, my father used to talk about um, biggers a lot in our house and they, you know, my parents collected, you know, quite a number of biggers pieces. Um, and this was kind of like the famous one that always had to leave the house, <laughs> uh -huh. go see the world and then come back home. But, you know, my father would say, oh, no, Jason, you have to look deeper into it because all the symbols you might be missing inside. And, yeah. you know, and I used to practice. There was another piece that I used to, the piano would be there and then the piece was on the wall right next to me. And so I'd be practicing and just staring into the pieces, looking at the crosshatch, looking at the, the shadow, looking at the figures' faces, then looking at the houses they're holding, then looking at what's in the bucket behind, by, beside them, then looking what's above the doors, you know, then looking at the birds, right? Like you just get caught in this web. Mm. And in Houston, John Bigger's work lives everywhere. It's murals, it's, you know, it's a mural at Texas Southern University, you know, like it's outside, it's, it's in other people's homes in the neighborhood. Like he's an artist really that kind of uh, populated people's visual uh, imagination. Um, and because he not only dealt with kind of what our neighborhood looked like, but he would also deal with what he saw in the marketplace in Ghana, you know, and he'd bring that back to us. And he would yep. show us this in a painting. And so, you know, as a music, like I'm a young teenager trying to learn how to play jazz, you know, uh, learning Thelonious Monk songs and, but staring at Biggers, he just let me know that, know that the world was much bigger than I ever imagined, you know, and that our ability to tell a story around it, you know, could be as vast as this, you know, that painting is, uh, is stunning, it's still stunning. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of was like the, it was the level at which I was going to always try to make music at the level of this painting. Yeah, there's definitely a rhythm in it mm -hmm. called, called pollen rhythm. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, there's definitely pollen rhythm, yes, which I hope to, to get to when we get to talk about Milford. Mm -hmm. Kyle, can we move to the next image? So I thought it'd be interesting to put this piece in, Nam Yun Pek performing piece uh, called After Rosa Boy's Action, and that was in 63. Uh, which also reproduced in, in the book of your show at uh, Walker Art Center, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to include here partly because you once say in your experience of being in the gallery, I was very taken by what you say. Uh, I don't mean just politically, but it's the, 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 the actual being there, why the space is silence. The work of art can speak very loudly. So mm -hmm. Nam Jung, you know, as we know, met Cage in the late 50s, both took part in fluxes happening. Nam Jung was deeply interested in Cage's silence, but he added his own creative strategy of destruction and the theatricality of kind of a collage that welcomed various medium in context of performance mm -hmm. and the public participation, also very important, as well mm -hmm. as change operation. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very um, interesting that you would include that mm -hmm. um, in, in the book. I mean, I know that so that means that you are interested in not just boys, Nam Jung, mm -hmm. but also the whole idea of uh, silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also that, you know, a machine at rest. <laughs> oh, and these are, right. you know, like um, pianos are a kind of technology that built with many parts, but they really require a user mm -hmm. to, 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 to interface with. And the user can show, show up with a lot of tools, as you can see, <laughs> some which are built to, 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 to manufacture, some which are built to um, destroy. And, um, mm -hmm. but I think also in this image is that you're, you're, you're reminded of the wiring, it, you know, looking at this now that Milford Graves has passed, it also feels very much how Milford's basement uh, of his house felt 
with possibly 10,000 wires connected to six or seven computers uh, draping everywhere across cadavers. You know, meanwhile, there's an extract on the wall. Is that a that that it felt that feels more um, akin to a musician's mind? Uh, mm. the, the how you manipulate an instrument to get the sound, but it, the amounts of traces that that the mind has to do to the body to get to get to get to that moment. Also, when you see this, you wonder like, okay, how does that instrument get to the ground like that? You right. know, um, there's also just an immense amount of care that that we see here. And I say and I say care, and I don't mean to say it flippantly either. <laughs> but um, but you know, but there's still the the care there for for the keeping the instrument as a receptacle. Um, yes, switch in a way the next image is the opposite of this, exactly mm -hmm. what you just described there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one that been, where is no sound, the piano is condemned to silence. Condemned. Yeah. And yet silence is still evoked sound potential. Mm -hmm. And so this is interesting because um, this is a piece of, I think 1965, 66, is called Homogenous Infiltration for Piano. Mm -hmm. um, Boys show a very complex relationship with Dushan because I think prior a year or two before he did a work called The Silence of Masha Dushan is Overrated. We don't have an image of it, but let's keep that in mind somehow mm -hmm. uh, because I'm interested somehow, maybe later we can pick up this idea of silence and destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kao, can we show the images of Alicia? There's two images coming up, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is your absolute comrade, soulmate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, she's remarkable. Um, yeah. So. yeah, also, yeah. you know, Alicia is a composer. She comes from also a bloodline of really uh, inventive and restorative kinds of musicians. Al Hibbler is on her father's side, who was a great singer who was blind, who sang with Duke Ellington. Yeah. Um, on her mother's side is the great um, kind of composer and also kind of, he wrote down Negro spirituals that his grandmother sang. His name was Hall Johnson. And yeah. Hall Johnson in the 20s and 30s and in the teens was kind of instrumental in, you know, coaching Marian Anderson and writing arrangements of Negro spirituals for Marian Anderson and many other people. Um, he was the go-to for black choirs. So Alicia comes from, she inherits in a way, all of this relationship to history, um, mm -hmm. but also then what it means for the voice. Like, so mine is at an instrument, but hers is through the voice. And this is something that Okwe in ways or rest his beautiful soul uh, commissioned from us called Work Songs for the Venice Biennial. Um, so it was a 40 minute meditation on work songs, uh, the, the history of black work songs in America. Yeah. Boy, uh, and you looked out right here, Jason. Yes. <laughs> Married to <a> tradition too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of it. And also, you know, yeah, yeah, I could go on and on. Okay, well, well, let's move from yeah. Oakby to this little intimate photograph of you two at Camp Kippy. Yeah. Some of that I ran into you guys uh, with your twin son, Malcolm and Jonas. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a nice photograph I thought I'd share with everybody here. Yeah, and but also, you know, you know, I think Joan kind of helped in, get us invited to come to uh, Camp Kippy. Because, you know, a lot of this is also just really about community. It really mm -hmm. is about how people sustain each other, um, how artists discuss with each other, people, you, when you're mid process with an idea, or when you just need to sit back and listen to other people, you know, talk about their practice for a while. And Kippy, uh, Camp Kippy was, you know, us with the family away from New York for kind of like the first time uh, and meeting a community of people like you. Um, so it really was a magical moment of, of an, in a shift and that the need for artists, communities, um, all kinds of artists uh, having communities away from maybe your workspace to a degree, but the need to come together in other spaces in another location that this, you know, this taught us, you know, profoundly the, 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 the necessity of it. 
except except when you do your presentation, you are <laughs> up there alone with only single light, you know, <laughs> at you. It's like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, but you you know, you get to play. I mean, for the yeah. rest of we have to talk. Um <laughs> um let's let's see uh this seminal piece by um adrian piper because it's it's a miraculous story how you met adrian and um here's a photo of both of you mm -hmm. well, first of all this seminal piece um which is very important piece um the piece that somehow reminded me so much you know jason i when i came to new york i wasn't aware of the work until her work until robert Stoll, a great show at moma is called dislocations hmm. um and i remember talking to him was 91 i think mm -hmm. i met rob in 87 when he was an interim dean at the new york studio school where i was a student mm. so we have remained friendship since but i remember this show it include installation of Louis Bourgeois, Chris Burden, Sophia Carl, David Hammonds, mm. uh, Kabakov, you know, Bruce Nauman, one of your uh, favorite mm -hmm. artists too, and Adrian Piper, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And it, it was then that I it opened up for me how my understanding of the issue of, and the problem of racial identity and mm -hmm. self-identification, not to mention racist stereotypes and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. And so can you share with us how how and how did you manage to get her involved? Yeah. yeah. I think it was around 2000, I don't know, three or so, three, 2003 or four, I was teaching up at Banff in Canada. Yeah. And there were other artists who were from Canada there and we were hanging out. And they were asking me, oh, which, you know, if you gave me four jazz musicians to listen to, you know, who would you li list? I list some people, but I said also, you know, well, what should I see? Mm. Um, because uh, traveling, you, you know, around the world, you can see a lot of different shows that don't come to America. Yeah. And both of them immediately said Adrian Piper is their top choice. Yeah. And so I was on the road in Barcelona and opened the hotel magazine. And there was this retrospective of Adrian Piper. I thought, oh, perfect. Well, this was, you know, I should see this. And I went and I saw this exhibition at MACBA. And I felt like the entire exhibition was like her pointing, like right in my face, you know? <laughs> yeah. I felt totally interrogated by every gallery, every mm -hmm. image, mm -hmm. every sound piece, you know, her whistling Bach, you know, um, just probing and and I would look at other people because I'm also the only black person in there. So I was like, well, how are they experiencing this work? You know, so, sometimes it's really great to see work not in America. I, um, and, and not in New York, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it was potent. And, and I returned to New York and Alicia, uh, her mother was a good friend of Maurice Berger. And um, right around the time when Walker Art Center asked, commission, wanted to commission a performance, I thought, oh, I would like to focus on Adrian Piper. Yeah. Because that's something I just, that I don't know. And, 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 and also, can I get in touch with her? And, uh, and I went up to Cape Cod and, and met with her for five hours sitting in her, in her house. Mm -hmm. And we talked about everything. And uh, this is our selfie at the end of the day, um, taken without a cell phone, but with a real camera. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and Adrian was a was really open and really, you know, curious about not how I got there. She didn't, you know, it was more like, well, you know, what questions did I have around the music that I was making? Yeah. But I wasn't asking myself yet. I mean, she's a great t teacher, so. She was helping me through this moment, you know. She's she talked about things like, oh, you know, maybe you're entering a mannerist phase, which I never hear in jazz. Kind of like this, it discussed in this way how language is used from one musician to another. Yeah. But she was kind of helping me, like really shift my viewpoint on it. And uh, one of the great things about this conversation was she did not allow any any. Well, I took this photograph, but I couldn't record the conversation. 
and I couldn't bring any paper or pencil into the house. Specific instructions. Specific instructions. <laughs> and you have to show up on time at one o'clock in the afternoon. So I, one o'clock, literally boom, 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 five hours later, walk out and we, I get in the car to drive back to New York and I turn on my recorder and I just try to download, recite everything I remember her saying over those five hours. Um, and that began a kind of, I mean, a, a relationship that we still have to this day. And now that she lives in Berlin, I call her every time I'm in Berlin or close by um, in hopes that we can meet up because she continues to, to jab, you know, um, and, and, and I, I rely on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's see David Hammond. I don't know whether you get to do anything with David, even <laughs> met him and talk to him. Yeah. Oh, that he's very elusive. Yeah. Um, this is taken. This is a famous piece called pissed off that was taken by our friend, Daewoon Bay. Yeah. Um, this is must be in the early 80s, maybe 1982. Um, so what choice was this that somehow made it in the, the, the book? Well, Hammonds is kind of everything, you know. Um, you know, I mean, cause you, technique is something is that is in the mind, not in the body. Um, it's... Uh, it lives everywhere. He thinks about the work everywhere. I don't, you know, and the times we've met each other because he also is a really close friend of Henry Threadgill. He's a close friend of Cecil Taylor, you know, like mm -hmm. Ornette Coleman. So he's in the community in a way. And um, I saw him a few months ago uh, when I was driving back from the studio and the recording studio. And I saw him on the street, like right, right on the Bowery, right above, right near the new museum. I pulled over and jumped out of the car <laughs> to <laughs> just say, Good to see you, brother. <laughs> you know, and we talked for a moment. He said, "Yeah, look, we're still here." And I, and as David is prone to do, his he's specific in a way like Thelonious Monk is really uses space to define space. Um, so Hammonds has always been a you know is an icon. He's he's just really an icon and a kind of uh, I always see him in the places that I least expect. And I remember people saying, you probably have seen him before, but you never knew it. And then, but once we met each other, then I would see him in the place and I would, you know, it could be a bathroom here at a Cecil Taylor show, or it could be at, Cecil, at Ornette's funeral. Like I would, I just would kind of like, he's in the world, um, but he uses the world in a way that, that, that you know, for me is, is always exciting. Um, he know how to activate space so beautifully, mm -hmm. even among people. Mm -hmm. He'd come in, he would leave, and you don't even know it, Jason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I had a, a, it was in a group show at Tribes, you know, at Steve Cannon's joint. Bless Steve, bless Steve. Bless Steve, another hero. We, we love Steve. And um, he came in to the opening, and this is maybe 90, 94, 95, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And uh, But anyway, I mean, this is another landmark artist that we he would talk about this thing like he would take a saxophone sometimes on the road an empty saxophone case while he was out traveling through europe and just walk into clubs <laughs> <laughs> you know like i you know i don't know he's yeah so he's just for as a musician he's part of the family you know he's yeah. just yeah. part of the family and he and he represents for us in a way that that intrigues us. So now it's really exciting that he's making this piece for the Whitney and Henry, Henry Threadgill is making the music for this piece, you know, so there's a collaboration happening now. That's terrific. Kyle, can we bring the next big important <laughs> essential member of the family here, um, namely our, our, our friend John Jonas? I think the next, uh, mm -hmm. this one is uh, the piece that I don't know why we didn't have any images from your collaboration with John mm. and Dia, mm. uh, but this would do somehow yeah. because this, I think it had your twin son in it. Yes. John is somewhere performance there. And so this- yeah, on the right. Where is she on, on the right? right? Exactly. Actually, yeah, yeah. Is that John? I, you know, yeah. I think John, no, John is on the right. Yeah. And yeah, my children are in the, in the middle, you know. Yeah. I don't know, Joan is, you know, Joan, um teach taught me about form yeah and uh, and how to break up a narrative you know how to break up a paragraph how to how to how to decode a paragraph to find like essential nuggets of language 
how to move those around, and then how to then, in the same way, use space in that in that with that kind of with that kind of idea in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she would need music to help do that, you know. So when we met at Dia, and she invited me up to uh, collaborate with her, we spent you know all summer working on the shape, the scent, the feel of things. And I had never played piano that much, no. uh, so she wore me out. Um, searching just in the mode of searching trying to create a piece and that felt great um so it's led to all these years of collaboration um that i finally I was like i have to document just the music of it so i made this three cd set called the music for joan jonas you know um <laughs> that really just like i have to put this stuff down because she also helped change my direction as a composer too just how to how to make a bed of music that 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 a narrative can sit on top of, you know, and then also sometimes charge against too. Uh, but Joan is, yeah, she's she's full of action and and um, and also, you know, full of all types of collaboration. Um, yeah, really brave in that way. Fifteen years working relationship between yeah. you. Two. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, I, I always have to go back to to Joan's piece, Organic Honey. Mm -hmm. I was in 72 or three, I think, which in a way brought back in full what had been, I mentioned earlier about minimalism, minimalistic repetition of action in dance and form in sculpture, for example, in phrases, in music and mm -hmm. poetry and so on. But she made room all of that and brought back magic, ritual, uh, all kind mm -hmm. of amazing aspect of theatricality, mythology, and mythology yes. from various culture, yes. you know, and, and all of which get transpired, transformed through, through Joan as a medium, mm -hmm. at conduit. Mm -hmm. yes. And then we all can participate as a community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Joan is miraculous. I, we, mm -hmm. we, uh, we are mm -hmm. grateful to her. Can we yeah. see, um, I think the next images, because yeah, mm -hmm. here's you and Joan playing. And that that was, um, I think that was in um, in the the, uh, the Teatro Piccolo uh, Arsenale in yeah. Venice, two thousand. So they come to us in the right. piece. They come to us um, for Venice. Right. I think you know. Also, what we do in each of these pieces, which developed since the first one, is there's always just a a duet moment between her and I, because I also really consider her a great percussionist. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of a requirement now that Joan sits down at the table with her toys or whatever she brings, you know, at that moment to create a duet, you know, sonic duet with. Um, yeah, she's really a sensitive um, listener too. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, so it's always, she's always fun to play with. That's great. Kyle, can we move to, um... The next image. So we we I I thought it'd be nice to sh to share with some of these um, because you know most of us don't get to go to the Walker Art Center to see the show, Jason. Mm. Um, so this we have some images that that Cal can flip through a little bit, but it it's a it's a it's a big big show for you. At at our friend Olga Viso say that it, it's me in the first museum exhibition that investigate the nature of your immersive interdisciplinary work. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share with us how did it come about? How long the process of realizing this show, considering making object, mm. you know, is a fairly recent practice in your creative repertoire. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least in your participation in the Whitney B Biennial mm -hmm. in 2012. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And even, yeah, back then it wasn't, I wasn't, I mean, I, I just wasn't ready um, to do that. But I think by the time the Walker asks uh, for an exhibition, it's also after Oakley kind of asks for the Biennale. And yeah. it was at the Biennale that I built these two stages. One was based on the Savoy Ballroom, which was an, a beautiful uh, uh, ballroom up in Harlem in the 1920s, where all the big bands played and yeah. a version of the Three Deuces, a, a smaller club in the 1940s in Midtown where Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Max Roach played. Me trying to think about not only what the music, what was the music that musicians were performing, 
But what is the space that they're, let's say, confined to? Um, and so the Savoy has this, as you can see in this piece, kind of had this unbelievable arch uh, when you see old, old photographs of it, of which there are also very few. That's also the other remark was somehow jazz spaces are not photographed. The people are, but the spaces yeah. are not. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, the other image you saw before was of a club called Slug Saloon, which was on the Lower East Side, right? Yeah. That one. And it also, you know, Bob Thompson hung out there, you know, Charles mm -hmm. Lloyd played there, Sun Ra had a weekly gig there, Ornette Coleman, Milford Graves played there with Albert Eiler. Like it's a really, it's a vibrant space. Yeah. Um, Archie Shep played there. So on that stage, that very stage there, um, there is, people have cameras, you know, like, like, <laughs> During the 60s and 70s, people have cameras and they're taking pictures of all kinds of things, but they're not taking the pictures of where the music happens. And um, there's only a handful of images of this club. Yeah. About the same ratio as from the 1920s. And that really disturbs me to a, de to a degree. Yeah. But I want to to make versions of these stages to, to lift them almost out of also that 2D space or off of a screen into a space. And so when someone walks into a gallery that they have to kind of think about what what these spaces mean, even when there are no musicians on it. That yeah. the space, that the way music has uh, has been uh, used for Black Americans is that the stage is a portal. It is not a stage the way you think it is. It is a way is a way to get away. Mm -hmm. um, and and these these places churn in that way. And the music that came off of there changed the direction of music in general. And um, but it's because they had some square footage to work with, and it generally is very humble. Yeah. Um, but I but I wanted to start to think about that, you know, as as opposed to what was the sound. But now let's think about what is the space, you know. Yeah, Kyle, can can we see the the very last piece just to make to to provide the context? I think that here it is. Right. Yeah, that's the three deuces. And this was a small club on 52nd Street in a basement with padded walls. Mm -hmm. And it really started from seeing a photograph of Max Roach, who goes on to be kind of become one of the activist drummers uh, in jazz. And but he's in this corner. So yeah. he's playing the most revolutionary instrument, the drums. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he's trapped in a corner in a in a padded corner. I don't know. All the metaphors were just screaming out of this photograph that William Gottlieb took of Max Roach. Yeah. That, that much like Adrian Piper coming out of that corner is him trying to come out, get out of that corner where he is, even though he's making groundbreaking music with Charlie Parker and Miles Davis. He's also, you know, like restless with it, too. Um, and we see that in the rest of his career as as the 40s expires and he gets into the 50s and the 60s. The message has to be amplified in the music and it cannot always exist in this corner. Yeah, well, as as Milford say, the drum is the most dangerous instrument mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of communication. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So it just makes sense. But you know how how to do it, Jason? Uh, what it means to you to recreate thing, images, symbol of the past, so to speak, mm. and do it without nostalgia and sen and sentimentality. Mm. So important here. Uh, so it's a very delicate balance to it recreate is. thing without having claimed the the actual knowledge. This is an, uh, so share share with us a little bit now that you have made a few of them. You know, also when I, when I made these spaces, they're also about community too. So everywhere these spaces go, I invite the community to come play on them. Yeah, um, that they don't just sit there vac vacant. So musicians, especially musicians who played slugs. I've invited many of them to play again on that stage. I mean, the recent record I have with Archie Shep, a lot of the photographs his son across Shep took are of us playing on that slug stage uh, as our publicity photo. Uh, Charles Lloyd coming back to like to actually to come leave the sweat again, mm -hmm. yet again, leave it in uh, on this stage again. Um, so I don't think of them simply as a thing that gets that gets shown and then gets stored away. Is actually a, a a place of still of invitation to musicians, wherever the the piece arrives. I mean, both of these pieces will continue to move around the world over the next couple of years, and we're inviting musicians. 
I mean, I'm very picky about who the musicians are. <laughs> <laughs> so not just anybody, but I, I think about the relationship to and the relationship to space that the musicians I know how they ask that question and how they provoke that that space uh, with sound that I think those are the great ones to, to, to bring in to interrogate it to see is this some bullshit or is this cool, you know, um, I yeah. ask, I, so I, that, I, so I, every time I invite an elder to come play on the stage with me, I know that it's a, it's a bit of a risk, but you know, each one of them shows up and is like, let's do it and dive. And, and we treat it, you know, like we would any other concert space and we really go, go hard on the stages. Yeah. Terrific. Kyle, can we now move to Jason's recent show with Lauren Augustine? Maybe this is still the two pieces before the show. This mm -hmm. is what also was included in the Walker vision. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would be um, interesting just to, to, to end with those two pieces, mm -hmm. partly because um, was it in 2016 that you began to make works on paper with charcoal powder pigment, rubbing on top mm -hmm. of the piano keyboard? What was the impulse behind this ongoing series of works? I mean, earlier we spoke mm -hmm. of Nam Yun Peck and, and Cage before uh, the, the, the tension that lies between silent and destruction. Mm -hmm. Would you be mindful also of Robert Rauschenberg, for example, uh, the, mm -hmm. the classic um, automobile tire print that was made, I don't know, mm -hmm. 20 something piece of paper that glued together and lay on the row mm -hmm. so that the car can run over a pool of black paint. Mm -hmm. I think it was made in 1953. Interestingly, uh, of course, we know it's his collaboration with Kate, but, but it was regarded as drawing, a performance, a process piece, uh, a, an amazing exploration of indexical mark making even. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's interesting. What is so interesting is that the same year, he also made his, his erase the Conan drawing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. a, a play, more a playful attempt to challenge traditional understanding of art and the idea of authorship. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that, that authorship is an interesting word in thinking about, um, I, I think about the residue left behind from a performance. Um, Right, so a musician can make a recording. That's one. You know, they could write out what they perf what they performed, and they leave a score. That's a, that's another. And yeah. then what else do we have after that? And uh, but our relationship with an instrument, the tactile relationship, also leaves a mark. Um, and how does that? How is that? How is that documented? Um, and clearly, watching Joan for years, watching how she uses the process of a performance to also generate not only. The piece itself, but also this kind of work that also l lasts longer um, in a different way, in a different format. That also was a big help uh, to think about. Then, what was I leaving behind on the keys? The mm -hmm. keys receiving all of these attacks, is a, which, which is what we call when 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 the finger hits the key. It's called an attack. We yeah. call, so, what is your what's your touch? What's your attack? And every pianist has a different kind of attack. So choosing a kind of paper, as you were saying before, or asking about choosing a gampy paper that is both fragile and sturdy, that can that it can accept an attack mm -hmm. and leave a mark from it that also has enough hair on it to kind of grab the finger and yeah. take the residue off of the uh, in the pigment to leave uh, to leave uh, the force behind. Um, and so these were the first kind of like, you know, like, t like testing it out as a as a subject, um, mm -hmm. but I think for musicians, we often just think of the sound as the end when it's, you know, that that asks that answers one part of the question, but not the, but there are more to ask for us. And so I've been trying to just continue to find other ways of, of leaving something else. Amazing, amazing continuity. Now we can go to the, straight into the show, Kyle, the recent show um, that Jason made in the matter of nine months from last spring to last winter. And it was made on the yard, the garden of Alicia's parents' home in Connecticut. So mm -hmm. I like to begin with a feel, very beginning, Kyle. Yeah, we have some installation view here so you can see that 
it's kind of a large body of work and I encourage you all to come and see the show now at the gallery. And in a way, um, I, you know, we, we talk about touch and I remember when you were talking in the, the probably the last interview, Jason, um, mm -hmm. of our friend Milford, mm -hmm. uh, whose show actually in the ICA in Philadelphia, uh, it's called Mind, Mind Body Deal, which ended last month. I think he passed literally a week or 10 days before the show ended. Mm -hmm. So it was his very absolute last interview. And mm -hmm. you were talking to Milford about how you talk to him like as if you, it, it helped you to understand your own internal life force mm. as well as you are seeing it in everyone else's, at least mm -hmm. those that come into contact in your life, you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And one way to, you, to keep yourself being mindful of this understanding as, as Milford say, is to talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to ask questions and, and be sure we don't take things for granted, yeah. which is so difficult because in America, America never fails to try to tell you that you all should, we should all take things for granted. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is how it, in, in some of the cases that we are so mindful of it, this is how things get materialized mm -hmm. or rather manifested in our sense of touch. Mm -hmm. A yeah. touch of a mm -hmm. gesture on a canvas, a touch on a keyboard in your case, mm -hmm. as much as your touch on the paper now through rubbing and so on. Mm -hmm. So in Milford's case, it's a membrane of, of the drum skin. Yes. Right. You know, um, so I like to begin asking how, how did you meet Milford and when did you discover his music? I mean, I heard his music probably when I moved up to New York um, by listening to Albert Eiler records. So he's the drummer with Albert Eiler. Yeah. And that's where I really pay attention to oh, oh, who's the drummer. Uh, you know, sometimes when we're listening, you hear something, you say, oh, well, who's that? Um, and you look on the back of the record to see who they are. And then you say, oh, I should, I want to hear more about them. I want to hear more of that work. And uh, so that was always the case here in New York. And then also, there was a moment when uh, another saxophonist, Steve Coleman, was really talking to Milford a lot, not only about his drumming, but also the relationship that Milford has to studying the heart, the heart muscle, the heart as a muscle, and documenting the movements of the heart to help and to create a, a, a computer program that would analyze the, the, the movements in the heart and amplify them into a melody. So Milford is thinking about this, not only for a sonic aesthetic part, but he's also thinking like, well, maybe I can heal people by playing rhythms into the heart, having the heart listen to rhythms. He really is asking this question and doing tons of research about it, you know, uh, and sharing it with the wider scientific community too. So I, I eventually invited, I met Milford first time by inviting him to the Park Avenue Armory where I curate a series called the Artist Studio. And yeah. I invited Milford to break open this room called the Veterans Room. Other people I invited that that season are Pauline Oliveros, you know, <laughs> like that's who I, I was like, I need people who really think about a space to come set off this first season. And Milford came in and really brought something truly uh, profound to, to, to the room. And from that point on, we kind of had a relationship, a uh, close relationship. And, uh, and I'm just finishing a record that I'll release in about two weeks of a concert we did together in 2018 at the Big Ears Festival in Knoxville, Tennessee. So yeah, Milford is, you know, rest his beautiful soul because he really was generous, not only with his music, but with his, uh, with his time and his space, you know, make, trying to lift people up. He really, he really spent a lot of his life doing that. Yeah, I, I love the way you describe his sound, Jason. You, you mentioned that um, it's like water keeping the parachute flying in the air. <laughs> mm. That was super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so the sense of touch vary in these cases, these images that we see here. They mm -hmm. are rubbing, they are on specific use of paper. Sometimes one 
feels that the moisture of the grass below mm -hmm. coming through there's certain kind of uh, environmental sense you can even say mm -hmm. so we can move forward a little bit here Carl so that people see there are a variety of rhythm, a variety of touches, leads, different calibration of rhythm and even direction of the, the way in which you rub against the piano keyboard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's illegible, Jason. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, are you, what, you, what were you thinking in creating these? You know, it's funny you say illegible because I, I think when I listen to Cecil Taylor play the piano, yeah. I probably wouldn't know how he did that, but fortunately there are videos of him doing it. <laughs> like, how can a body do that? You know, like it doesn't make any sense because he's still playing the same 88 keys that many pianists play, but all of a sudden he's found an entirely new language on it. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, through this process, probably in this last body of work, I finally tried to start contesting what the orientation of the keyboard was. Many times it is pretty much horizontal left to right you know, like we read and I had to start to, but I don't play music necessarily that way. I don't think I would never teach a musician to play that way. Yeah. So why would I make art that way? <laughs> so I keep, <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm still trying to learn about this um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, as a, as a method. Um, and, you know, and maybe, and over time, I know it's going to shift the way that I approach this, the piano because, um, well, it just, it's just how those things influence each other. Yeah, I mean, definitely there, there's, a, the, the, there's a sense of atmospheric, uh, you know, space surrounding this form mm -hmm. that informed them too. Kyle, can you mm -hmm. just move a little bit? Yeah, these, these are good example, Jason, because th these are, mm -hmm. one feel there's something like there's a horizon line for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But then this form is looming, lum, like beginning to lift up itself and and then you were sharing with us the other day that, that you decided to make it into a series yeah on the spot. well i'm also still learning about you know studio practice since i don't have a studio that you know people you know artists you know keep work up to live with what it you know to to live to see it on a wall um and to walk back in three days later and see it or see it two months later but the way I had been working, because I don't have space like that, was I would just stack stuff up and then just put it away and then move on to the next one. Kind of like you would a concert. You just, you, you could listen back to it, but you don't really. You keep moving forward. But then finally in the exhibition, when we started pulling the works back out again, it was the first time seeing work together. So this as a suite seemed more, uh, and also I had other friends like Lorna Simpson, Glenn Ligon and Thelma Golden walk in and say, yeah, no, you need to make that a suite. <laughs> So, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I trust their, their opinions, other people from the gallery, you know, like, so it also helps when you, you know, I remember watching Joan do this. I mean, I, pivotally, I can, I can r vividly recall in our first, my first rehearsals with Joan, how many questions she asked to her collaborators and it didn't matter who it was. She always, so what did you think about that? Or you know, can you give me, you know, like she would always kind of ask. Yeah. And, um, and that allowed her another to hear another viewpoint. So, so this exhibition kind of was, you know, like, uh, was, 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 is also a community project. Terrific. You know, what is so interesting too, when I remember talking to Henry about Peter Brook, mm. you know, one thing that we, I don't know whether it would be, um, uh, useful to mention that Gurdjieff have a big mm. role, huge interest in in that community. Mm. Oh, I I learned about Gurdjieff from different way. I mean, it's just that one of my professor in college was a devotee, mm. so I learned about the fourth way through that book, Meeting the Remarkable Man, which turned into a movie that made by Peter Brook. Mm. And and I was thinking about this a great deal because you know your um, you, your admiration of Thelonious Monk, you know the the his ability to admit admitting notes mm -hmm. to add dissonances, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about Peter Brook, uh, the, that book in the late '60s. Maybe Joan would know. Um, the, it's called the Empty Space. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to 
propose ways in which how can you take away from the theater itself, the mm. light, the stage, mm. the curtain, everything that mm. you could possibly do. Mm. But in, in the end, one thing you couldn't take away is the actors in the space and the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, so you are the musician, so you need the audience to perform too. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was thinking, how does that equate? How does that man, you know, materialize into the work of art? I mean, it's so interesting. I see it, the kind of biological rhythm mm -hmm. that, that somehow um, Mil, you know, Milford talk about that. Mm -hmm. So he talked about the, the cardiologist yeah. and the artist should hang out <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and exchange their information, yes. remember? Yes, yeah. It'll make life more interesting. <laughs> it would make life more interesting. Um, can we see a few more here, Kyle? Yeah, in this instant, you stack it up the form, you fill up the visual feel, mm -hmm. the pictorial feel. Um, and also a calibration of the blue pigment. How did that come into being? I mean, I mean, it's, it, the, I can never get away from it, one. As a, as a musician growing up in Texas, hearing the blues, knowing that it's also, I mean, it sounds so simple and reductive to say, but there's not another music named after a color. Um, that, which then asked the question, well, what is it about the color? And yeah. how, the, how the, the color is used in North Africa as a healing, you know, um, how, it, how it combines with the rhythms uh, in Morocco for a, a, a healing, you know, to someone who is sick. Um, it's the sound that we hear Bessie Smith and Louis Armstrong when they play St. Louis blues, mm -hmm. is that the blues lives everywhere and it's not just in America, um, mm -hmm. that, it, that it floats everywhere. So you can hear a version of it in India, you can hear a version in Japan, you can hear one in Australia, in the Brazil, you know, in Mexico. Um, and, and so, so, it also just ha carries all the hues in it too. I meaning, yeah. meaning, you know, like the blues changes. I'm talking about the music now. The blues changes from decade to decade, and by the time it gets to the mid 20th century, the blues feels it. It feels like it's exploding. So Charlie Parker and them have made blues is very fast, yeah. and they have all kinds of activity because they're in New York City. They're no longer in the Mississippi Delta. Um, so the, the blues has migrated. Um, yeah. The blues has migrated from the Delta all the way up to Chicago. Yeah. And it brings a sense of being in an in a industrial city. And um, so I just kept buying and looking for the right blue over and over again. And some of them I like, and some of them were toxic and I didn't know. Um, yeah. I stopped using those clearly. Um, and and, and, it, and then, I, then I found a, one that I liked um, because other people suggested some blues for me. I mean, anytime I say that someone suggests a blue, um, it feels like my life is better. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> it has a color and as a sentence, I need to have uh, more of. Um, and also, the biggest one is in America and especially in how music is studied is the deletion of the blues yes. as a subject. Yes. Because if you're going to talk about the blues, that means you have to talk about centuries of, of oppression of black people in America yeah. and why it then shows up in a sound that is so firmly also connected back across the water to yeah. Mali, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. how somehow centuries later we still have the sound and it wasn't written down, you know, mm -hmm. so it's passed down through sound that it gets to us. So it actually still has you know, all the essence of, of, a, of, a, of a fulfilled ancestral life uh, yeah. to, to still devote time and space to the blues. Jason, did I ever tell, I never told you, did I ever tell you that, that I met, I hung out with Bo Diddley once? Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I have a friend who, whose father was the manager of mm. Spectrum um, Stadium in Philadelphia. So there was an eighth concert that he came and played Mm -hmm. So there was a huge party afterwards. So I get to meet Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley yeah. And um, I remember asking him, um, how did you get your name, sir? He said, I got my name from the Diddley Ball. Right. He said, what? What Diddley Ball? And then he started explaining to me where it yes. came from. 
Right. And it, it, I realized immediately that whatever you des describe how the blues migrate from Mississippi, mm -hmm. Delta, I mean, the good example would be Muddy Waters, you mm -hmm. know, early acoustic music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when he reached to chess record, began mm -hmm. to record more electric, electric mm -hmm. blues. Mm -hmm. And then the record got disseminated. disseminated. Mm -hmm. it, it's sent by the 70 all the way back to back to Africa. Yes. yes. And everyone there is excited. This sounds is very, very much like our music. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they took it back. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. took it back. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. boomerang. Um, how can we see the next one? Several one. This one is is the biggest one in the show. Mm. And it seemed to be had made on a thicker paper, I believe, Jason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what I, I was talking earlier and you, you know, your your son Jonas pointed out like a lightning feel. Yeah. Landscape in the background. That was amazingly perceptive of him. It is. It is. Thank God for the eyes of children. Um, but yeah, yeah, a thicker paper also is it possible to tell a longer story, you know? So yeah. still in the middle of of learning with this form also. So um, yeah, I'm just happy to kind of see some of these things, you know, over time because I have to continue to learn about 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 it. You know, um, a lot of musicians we get, you know, our our you know, studio crit doesn't happen. It happens in real time. Somebody yells at you in the middle of the song. That's yeah. when they yell at you. Uh, so we don't have like a crit, you know, like somebody coming into your studio and, and then you talk, let's talk about the work for about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually talking with you and, and, and other friends who have been to see the work to help, to, to, to just kind of help, I don't know, to help, help, well, just to just offer more language um, mm -hmm. as I move forward. It's really been helpful over the past month uh, to, to have to have a show and, and to and to learn about it with everyone else. Yeah, but the patina on this piece is outrageously subtle mm. and yet spookily powerful because mm -hmm. I don't know where that dark cloud or environment in the back come from, whether mm -hmm. underneath, whether it's absorbed the, 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 the wetness of the grass through the cloth, which mm -hmm. we will see in it. Um, it's just alchemically surprising and it has mm -hmm. such an aura to it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you know, like when you hear a good piece of music, I'm just gonna talk about music right now, but when I hear a good piece of music, you know, it, it, it like churns and it can happen sometimes in the first 10 seconds of you pressing play to hear a band or hear an orchestra or whatever. You know, the beginning, beginning of an opera in the overture, it like sucks you in. And, um, but then some other instrument comes to emerge after the intro. And then that starts to tell the story of the song. Um, and when it's done right, you could sit there for hours just listening to this song over and over again. That's how I was listening to St. Louis Blues all yeah. night long, all today before this call, listening to St. Louis Blues with Bessie Smith. Yeah. singing about this man whose neck she wanted to cut, you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, like that. So, uh, you know, I also am still kind of having this fractured relationship with what it means to make a sound and then what it means to leave an image, but also try to have one really totally inform the other without necessarily saying that I have to focus on the aesthetic of it. So, it's still, a, you know, not to get sucked into what I see, much like I would ask the questions about what I'd play. Oh, am I playing this simply because I like it or I've trained myself to like it? You know, yeah. as an artist, I still have to, to, to and that's why I uh, collaborate with so many other kinds of artists, whether they're in film, they're writers, whether they're choreographers, uh, because they don't, they listen in a different way and they'll be able to push me into another territory that I might not arrive at on my own. Uh, and so this is kind of also like challenging me in that way too. Terrific. I love this piece and uh, I hope somebody will have it before I get it. <laughs> Kyle, can you move forward a few? Yeah, I mean, this is, and then, then this square piece was very surprising, Jason. Mm. Um, all of a sudden you have this square format and the multiple diagonal is being, you know, 
congregated right in the middle there, um, which we once talk about Fat Waller, mm -hmm. one of your you know important musician early on, mm -hmm. and I I couldn't help but Mondrian too was an admirer of Fat Waller, mm -hmm. Boogie Googie. In fact, the later painting was named after some of those songs, the, mm -hmm. the inspiration, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. And it just uh, the neutral square is 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 neither landscape that identified with horizontal format nor the vertical, which is a human figure. So I thought it was interesting this one, which is very few in the show, that mm -hmm. had this format and then much more active in movement. Can you mm -hmm. share with us what the impulse was? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting to hear about the square as neutral. Um, because it's also the most terrifying shape to function to I don't know I felt like to funk to work yeah. well I'll say making these I was more nervous about them you know like the only thing in music that shows up as a square is a record you know like like the LP comes in a square jacket you know yes. um so I'm used to it in that way um mm. and making something for that kind of square a CD or LP but then making this one it it, it for me, it's more, I don't know, it feels more challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't even necessarily have a, is this good or bad part, but I feel more challenged by it. And hearing you talk about landscape and human figure, you know, maybe that's part of it. Um, but also I think about the the ways that other people have used the square, you know, whether it's Saul LeWitt, who's a hero, um, the way he thinks about the cube, you know, mm -hmm. and I also think about the square in the, in relationship to just, you know, like the, quote unquote, cool factor that jazz always tries to have with nothing should be square. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be a square. You know what I mean? Like all, yes. all that relationship, I, that maybe is also part of it. It's like, ooh, you know, like the square is a little bit more intimidating to, yeah. to, to, to push through. Uh, and you make me now ask, as I move back into the, uh, making some new stuff this year, like really to try to interrogate it, maybe in a smaller scale, but to, to really think about what, you know, the neutrality of it uh, that you call out is. Yes, for an artist to be square is a disaster, yeah. but that's another <laughs> thing altogether. It's not about the format, that's poured in Jonas Makers. Uh, Kyle, can we see a few more? <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of them are just atmospheric and lyrical. Mm -hmm. You know, like this one is so mm -hmm. minimal and it it's happening capacity for incredible. Yeah, you know, and also, you know, I think that these are about, you know, in when you making music in a room, you the music is only a small part of the room is the other part and the and the listener is the biggest part if there is one. Yeah. And so the paper in these kind of also has a serious life. Um paper yeah. that I get from um from Washi out in LA. Um yeah. it has a serious life and it has its own reaction to the attack. And uh, so the pigment then documents its reaction to it. So I really also, you know, like that the paper has its own ear uh, to a degree to what it to what it's to what it's hearing uh, and feeling. Yeah. And it and it and it does it um, to a degree. That's the sense of touch we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, is there any more? So this is the 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 I guess they would call it in construction pen cloth, Jason. Mm. That that's where everything was made on top from the yard, and mm -hmm. clearly is accumulated all the wear and tear, the the pigment, the pouring, and also from the earth coming from below mm -hmm. that create that scene through patina. Mm -hmm. And the last minute you decided or declaring it as a work that mm -hmm. need to be included in the show, the origin like a stage in a way, stage, this is your yeah. stage, a yeah. performing platform. Mm -hmm. um, so share with us, talk about this. Yeah, I mean, this is the, this is, I mean, you know, they have this show called MTV Cribs and, or they used to, and they used to go over, you know, musicians' houses and then the musician would usually say, well, this is where the magic happens. They, and then they would kind of go like, voila. Um, but since the musicians weren't on tour last year, nobody was. Um, there was all these concerts that did not happen. And part of making the work felt like the only performance I was gonna do. And they all happened on this space, in this stage, um, 
on this, you know, nine by 12. And, oh, and then, and then that then sopped up everything from the rain, from the sun, from the animal, you know, the animals that lived underneath, you know? Um, and then by the time I was, had finished and was trying to clean up, um, that it also felt like, nah, this was, this is, this is the stage much like the three deuces was the stage. Yes. Much I was like the Savoy that. is the stage that is part mm -hmm. of that series. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's another version, but I, but I think it has, um, it is, it, it is a home though. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Um, yeah. well, listen, I, I think we need to do part two, Jason, because we partly, <laughs> I it, no, we didn't manage to talk about all these, you know, heroes, pianists and uh, well, yeah. musicians that, that you admire. I mean, we need to, to go through with that, but for, for the sake of welcoming, you know, our friends here, the Q and A, cause I'm sure there's people who would love to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. So why don't I, I, I just um, give it back to Carl. Okay, great. Thank you, Fong. We've got a lot of good questions. Um, first one is from Una. I'm going to ask her to unmute you now. Oh, wow. I didn't expect to be <laughs> on screen. Um, I love you, Jason. I love your work. Um, I listened to the interview you did with Milford uh, on Zoom a bit ago. It was incredible. Um, I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit, um, if maybe you were influenced by Terry Adkins' work and what his conversation is with Blue. Yes. I mean, rest Terry's beautiful soul. Um, Terry is a hero. Um, also an extreme collaborator too. Um, you know, I'm sure lots of artists probably, you know, when Terry passed, they were like, oh, we were just about to start a collaboration. Uh, he was, we were gonna start a collaboration actually about Bessie Smith. Um, and, but yes, Terry is insanely important also as a performer, also as a person who used the music as a way to define space. So whether he's thinking about John Coltrane, whether he's thinking about his own practice as a saxophonist, um, and also gathering bands of musicians to kind of generate in a space. So, and then going to these extreme spaces, you know, like taking his body to the, you know, to the North Pole, right? Um, but he's also, you know, the, that is the best way to challenge the mythology about, about what, well, I'd say, well, what, it, what, what black art can be. Um, that this is also very much a, a moment that Terry Atkins helped birth all of this, you know, that's that I see happening right now is because Terry was out here pushing it in a way um, that, yeah, I'll, I'll stop at that point. But but Terry is insanely important. In my first show, I had a piece dedicated to Terry, which were these temple blocks in this case, you know, uh, like a temple for Terry. Um, because he yeah. And also, he you know, he he was also he would also charge you in a way that a musician would who would just try to talk some shit to you just to see how strong you were. <laughs> and uh, so I also love that about him, you know, much like Hammond's like he's a part of a musician community uh, in a very organic way. Um, because he always thought about it as as something f much more than just the music and the sound itself, that it could that it could challenge uh, those who interacted with it. But yeah, thanks for talking about Terry. Love him. All right. Thank you for your question, Una. Um, next, we had a good question from Doug. I will ask to unmute you now. Thank you. Jason, I, I think you nailed it when you talked about collaborations. And I realize now, uh, you know, that you're, you're a crossover, but and, and the art world looks at crossovers in very interesting ways, sometimes with skepticism, <laughs> you know, sometimes with ultimate respect. But what you totally made clear during this session was that the collaborations that you look for open your mind and your imagination and your eyes and your spirit and feed you in ways beyond and in addition to the music. So Joan, Joan is obviously one of those conduits for you, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if I would like to just revisit this, this, this idea of elders, because mm -hmm. um, I was talking with Bob Stewart, who you know, mm -hmm. great Bob Stewart. 
Mm -hmm. And the conversation was around creativity and aging. And it's one thing to be a pianist. It's another thing to, to be a tuba player, right? <laughs> yes. um, but one of the things we talked about was, was the respect that elders receive in the music world. Mm. And I've always found that really interesting. And, and, you know, where younger musicians naturally gravitate to the elders and learn at their at their knees with mm -hmm. with utmost respect mm -hmm. in the art world it's a little bit different and i mm -hmm. don't know quite why it may be financial it may be competition it may be there are a lot of factors that come in that seem to deflect it mm -hmm. does happen but i'm just wondering you know given that you are now very much a part of the art world uh those two you know, poles between the music and the fine arts um, in particular, um, whether you have any ideas around that. Yeah, it's, I, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I used to ask people like who their mentors were, you know, uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it could be like the, the guy who was fixing my tire, you know, um, and um, I don't know if music is, and especially playing jazz because it's not an old art form, right? It's like just over a hundred years old now, you know? Um, there's still so much, like no one we know knew Mozart, not a soul. <laughs> <laughs> Yet his music is played over and over again, right? No one we knew, no knew Beethoven at all, right? But if there was someone, believe me, everybody would be knocking on their door trying to get an interview. So, well, what is it about the person who played drums with Charlie Parker? Or what is it about, you know, the guy who lived around the corner from Mary Lou Williams? Or what is it about, you know, like, what is it about Duke Ellington's daughter, you know? Um, and so music for me, like coming to New York is I'm always, I'm in search essentially for that. And, um, and I also know that in my community, it also goes beyond music. So it's to me knowing who Judith Jameson is and what she means to Alvin Ailey, right? It, it goes to me knowing what Cecil Taylor means to the piano. And it goes to, you know, it goes to knowing who Mir Baraka is for poetry, you know, Sonia Sanchez, right? Like always knowing who all of that strata is, not even simply just within this music field, because that'll be some kind of odd world, maybe that, that, you know, is strange, but even like Bob Stewart, having Bob on the road, you know, every, this piece we do together, it's about Thelonious Monk. And at the end of the show, every time he picks up his big tuba, <laughs> and then we walk through the audience, out past the audience into the foyer and then perform another piece. And, and we make sure Bob is cool coming down the steps as he gets, you know, like we have to take care of Bob because we got to do this show again tomorrow night in another country. Um, there's just something about just, we also know that for our work, because we travel the world so frequently that we will also need someone to do the same for us because our turn will essentially come. Milford talked about this a lot, is why he kept his door open to having totally uh, lots of young musicians in there with him. Um, but yeah, in our community, we do do it a lot because we need it because our form is still being, being, being made and the people who made the language that we use cr like literally created it. So they're there as primary sources is no longer um, something that's just a historic fact, um, but they are people with full lives. So I just aim to be around it. Uh, and I try to also tell young musicians I work with to keep that, that, that really wide view about who they need to be around because it'll only value them later on as they get through life. Thanks for asking. Say hello to Bob, I have to call him. I will. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next, we got a question from Ahmed. I am asking to unmute you now, if you'd like to answer your question. This is, um, this is really such a wonderful thing to, um, to be able to, I didn't know this about you, uh, Jason, that you, you know, had this other life. Um, and certainly it, um, it's, it was an interesting thing also to find out very recently that uh, that you had done a duet with uh, with Milford Graves, mm -hmm. you know, because Milford Graves played at Sister's Place mm -hmm. a concert there uh, many, many 
years ago uh, in our early days. And, you know, uh, of course, you were there to play for our 25th anniversary mm -hmm. in a, just a magnificent presentation. And it was so wonderful. You know, I met Milford Graves uh, in 1977. Um, I, uh, I was there working at Festat with Sun Ra. And the first person I met when I got off the plane was Milford Graves. <laughs> and he gave me like a, a 25 minute dissertation on how to survive in Lagos, Nigeria in the Festac village. And it was one of the most important messages I got for the two weeks that I was there. He was that kind of cat. Okay. And to find out that you, uh, you know, did a duet with him was one of the most magnificent things. I think you actually answered the question because the question that I had for you was how did you uh, really get to know and understand? And I can understand from you know the presentation that you've made, how your ears are so open and to the ground and to be able to know who Milford is, mm. you know, which is not a thing that happens generationally Mm -hmm. in this music that I call music of the spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you obviously, uh, you know, uh, one of those people who is in tune with the forces mm -hmm. of the universe and the music of this. But, you know, you can just, uh, you know, just a relationship with Milford Graves. Yeah. You know? Well, first of all, it's good to see you. And thank you for reminding me about how beautiful it was to be at Sister's Place in Brooklyn playing some music for the people. Yeah. <laughs> so that, 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 that alone is already, you know, a lot. You know, because I think what you're talking about and what the, what I hear is about the way the tribe speaks to one another. Mm -hmm. And the tribe always knows when they are around other tribe members. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, it's just, you know, you feel it, you hear it. It could be in how somebody says a word before they even play something. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, you, you're you on that, right? And, uh, and every tribe has, you know, elders in the tribe. And, and you might not know who they all are at once. And it sometimes takes years to find, go looking for them. And, um, and Milford kind of shows up that way because there's, a, there's also, a, like, I wouldn't say there's a hierarchy, but there are people who, who store up the energy for a community and they disseminate it and they keep their door open so they can disseminate it. And, um, and I'm always kind of in search for the, uh, for that for the future history of the music that needs to be made, you know, for the names that don't get put in the books over and over again and don't win downbeat awards or, you know, these kinds of, you know, get all the articles. It's been great to see that Milford late in his life also was getting the kinds of attention he should have been getting, you know, uh, the kinds of press, this beautiful documentary on him called Full Mantis, which I really think people should watch. It's one of the most magnificent musician doc well, documentaries about a subject. Um, because Milford didn't see a delineation about what went where. Um, it all existed as one. And musicians like to talk about it, but few of us practice that. <laughs> and Milford, I think, really practiced it in a way that, you know, would make any person who came in contact with it have to interrogate their own practice right. and be like, hmm, where's my shortcoming? And I know where mine are, right? That I think I know. <laughs> but, but Milford, one of his last things was to me, was like, you got to figure that out. You know, he left me with the question before he passed. Right. And um, yeah, so that that's it's still, you know, he, he lives in my mind because he he was able to provoke those questions rather than just try to answer them. Mm -hmm. I, I like to add that to Ahmad, you know, um, one thing about Milford is that he also make art. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he lived in the same house where he grew up every weekend, every Sunday, he came to visit his grandmother. And that's the how he inherited from her. So there's a continuity in, in that historical sense of the family. And it go beyond the family. And I think that his, his work speaks so loud the way that, you know, that, that melodies that come out from the drum to say not only what he means, but also his, what his grandmother means, you know? I think that what we, we, we talk about, I think Jason and I sort of talk about that. It's the, 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 the melody is allowed to be loud. So it's, it's loud, but also it's allowed to be loud. And, uh, and I think that 
what we talk about silence earlier that, that Jason was referring to one, he walks into a gallery, the gallery might be silence, but the works of art is loud, you know? And this country set up, set us up to repeat a lot, not to create, which is, you know, it's not an easy map to follow. And I think that that's what one thing we learned from Milford. Um, he, there's no demarcation in his creative repertoire whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Go back to you, Kyle. I'm sure there's okay. more questions. Thank you so much, Shaman, for that question. Uh, next, we have a question from our good friend, Jason Rosenfeld. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Cal and Fung. Uh, thank you, Jason. This has been fascinating. Another Jason here. I have a question for you about your collaboration with Ranyar uh, Cardinson on scenes from Western culture from 2015 and that amazing film of you with Felicia. Uh, and I wrote a review of it for The Rail. I'm just wondering how that impacted you in thinking about visual art and also about durational aesthetics, durational art, which he's so f fantastic at and, and explores so deeply. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Ragnar thinks about music, you know, in a as a long form, actually longer than the composer initially considered it themselves. Um, and what he asked Alicia and I uh, about was a, a simple gesture, which turned out to be nothing but pressure uh, for us to sit and have lunch together <laughs> while we were dressed up um, in a midtown establishment full of all of its, you know, conservative pomp. <laughs> Um, but Trump's favorite restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> it's, so, it's so out. This is the Twenty One so, Club. Um, so so, but Ragnar, you know, he he also he makes music. His wife is a musician. He sets music. Uh, he resets music. Um, and that's something that I'd say probably generationally we come from like uh, uh, as I was saying before, like the same kind of tribe in that way, and that you you. That because the composition has exists does not mean it can't be interrogated too, uh, that you can't reformat or replace its meaning or its context or its frame, or take the framing off of it. And um, so Ragnar has been um, and being also in a with Luring Augustine who works with Janet Cardiff, you know, who works with Ragnar, like that. There's a relationship to to artists who who used and pull sound and think about form. Uh, um, and time, you know, um, yeah, that piece was also, you know, I mean, I mean, being an uh, being in a piece, you know, the same with Lorna Simpson's piece called chess, where she, um, she dresses herself up as a man and a woman playing chess in a mirrored room, um, and scoring that and also sitting in a piano in a mirrored space and recording it. There's a different, there's a different way to be documented that I think musicians rarely think of ourselves as subjects that way. So it always helps to have someone else, another eye to look at the scene that musicians just so system, you know, you know, systematically just fall in to reimagine what the possibility is. Um, I haven't seen the piece that Ragnar has right now at uh, in Bushwick. Um, but yeah, Stan Douglas in the same way, you know, this six hour piece Luanda Kinshasa, you know, like thinking about how to pull, a musician would never, never want to think about time that way, <laughs> you know, but people do, you know, um, right. who's this, uh, Palestine, Charlie Pal Palestine. Okay. I'm just basic on his name now. Um, but in performance, it feels something else, but, but Ragnar was, he, he just asks us to, to, to make sure we don't just consider it as, as the end all once the score is finished. Um, that it's actually the, the, the first stop. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Next, uh, gonna hand it over to Patricia. A number of questions. Here you go. Can mute yourself. If oh, like. hi. <laughs> I didn't think you were gonna call on me. Well, hi, hi. Jason. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, three things. Well, I'm glad you work with Joan Jonas, whose work I saw when I first came to New York back mm. in the night. Early 70s, uh, and I think Ms. Jonas is a genius. Um, a couple of things. One is, um, besides her, 
who are some of the other women uh, um, artists that you have worked with? And two, um, why didn't you put that big piece on the floor? Mm -hmm. um, because it would have worked perfectly yeah. given what you said about how it was created. So yeah. Those are the two things, everything else you've already answered. Yeah. Well, lo lo um, other artists who've been pivotal uh, that I've worked with, Julie Merritt, who, uh, in a collaboration with her as she was making these two pieces for SF MoMA, and she made in this in this this chapel was well, church in uh, in Harlem. Um, mm -hmm. That was one. Uh, Lorna Simpson, um, because of how she uses photographer and the image, and also narrative, planting the narrative on the image itself. Same with. Uh, collaborating with Carrie Mae Weems as well. Um, Adrian Piper, because she just changed all of my mind around. Um, it's like, and she did it with language. And then she asked me to also have language. The reason that I'm able to even, and I don't even know if I'm talking with any kind of coherency in this right here, <laughs> but the reason that it even feels flexible, I feel flexible enough to do it is because of her. Um, uh -huh. Because she, because of a statement she made, which is artists ought to be writing about what they do what kinds of procedures they go through to realize a work and what their presuppositions are. If artists' intentions and ideas were more uh, accessible to the general public, I think it might break down the barriers between the artist, the art world, and the general public. Like that became a mantra for me. And it wasn't okay. simply to be able to speak, but then it was also to be able to, to try to write it down. Um, well, but, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm, you know, when you were talking about the stage sets that you were using, Mm. Uh, from the different clubs and uh, you know one I didn't see was because when I first came to New York I didn't slugs is already closed but I went mm. to a lot of of uh, loft jazz mm. uh, things which were also stage sets in their own way mm. and I was wondering did you try to do something like recreate what happened to Studio Ribby? Well, how do you know that's the other? next one I want to do? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. well, I'm, just, I'm just asking because yeah. I, I mean I knew about these things but yeah. again that thing about that was, you know, one of the great, one of the few things I like about minimalism, or one of the few, is the use of the floor. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering why, if you had thought about that mm -hmm. seriously, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, the, the, I'll talk about what I have in my mind for what Rivby is, you know, okay. um, because there's only, I mean, do you have images of Studio Rivby? No, because I didn't have, I didn't have a camera, honey. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, like somehow it's always the same number of images. No matter how famous this place was, it's always like 30. <laughs> well, but I'll tell you, you know why? Yeah. Because people were really listening. Mm. And and they were really, it was, because it really was a sonic space. Mm. And so the visuals that you were thinking about were about who was playing at that moment and what it sounded like. Right. That is why maybe there isn't that much. Although there were people drawing, like the yes. brother, the guy, white guy who was always drawing great stuff and he's mm -hmm. around, but nobody was dealing with this, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it, it begs me, it's, it's a big question, you know. Um, but I've seen, and you could verify this, there's a, there's a book coming out um, about the scene and I saw an image of Riv B where floating from the ceiling was like this large parachute, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And and I thought, in a way, I've only been in one space that had a parachute as a ceiling, and they only did it really to shield the sun from the stage because it was outside. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that somehow Beatrice and Sam Rivers had thought to put a parachute, whether it was functional or not, to have it be above as a ceiling was even a greater kind of beautiful metaphor I'd like to see in person. There's a something that 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 like I gotta say that that still no matter what the listening space is, mm -hmm. um, that I beg people to document the space to listen in that we listen in, um, that we we gravely need it uh, for the future um, because you're gonna tear that place down, <laughs> uh, and and then all that will live all that lives where Savoy Ballroom was was a, is a small you know small like a pedestal mm -hmm. that says Savoy Ballroom. Yeah. And, um, but well, the Tin Palace doesn't even exist anymore. Right. So, you know, like this, you know, the half note, all these places. Um, so even though this is, this is partially amusing, 
about those spaces as a musician. Um, mm. And also the reason that that this one is on the wall is because it's light enough to go on the wall, get on the wall. Okay. <laughs> those other ones are like <laughs> a thousand pounds, because believe me, I think that they should be floating in the air. <laughs> But this could go on the wall. It can happen. It can and, yeah, and I could always take it down. Maybe I'll take it down on Saturday and put it on the floor. That's just a note to the gallery. And <laughs> you can come step on it. <laughs> yeah, let's see what it looks like. I'm not joking. I mean, yeah. I, I really, I mean, I know this um, because it, it, it struck me when you, were, when you were talking to Fung about this, that yeah. it was so much about what fell onto it. Yes. Yeah. And, but and, really also what was growing up into it. Yeah. Like there was a yeah. lot of growth going up into this, into this canvas. Anyway, that, I will know. shut up now because other people. Well, I love talking them. to you. <laughs> oh well, Jason. You know, you guys made when when we were doing the 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 um the uh, Museum of Modern Art thing with the Jacob Lawrence stuff. Mm, mm -hmm. That night when you guys did the the music performance was just wow. absolutely amazing. And for for we poets and and who are participating, it was like that was that was a gift. So we wow. was like, thank you for that. Okay. And, you know, think about collaborating with we poets, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Uh, you. <laughs> thank you so much, Patricia. Sorry to spring that one on you, but, but thank you for, for asking your questions. Um, so I'm so sorry to all the all the questions that we we didn't get to so many good ones in the chat. But um, I wanted to hand the mic back to you, Jason. I don't know you and Fong had talked about a little piano performance oh my god yeah can i play something really quickly because yeah i'm talked out <laughs> absolutely what do you what do you think uh maybe uh monk dream or rudy my dear or any i'll do monk's dream that's a, that's a good one yeah i'll do monk's dream um and it'll be short because i also want to hear some poetry so i'll play a, a chorus of monk's dream okay hope it's I, could, I need to play more. <laughs> <laughs> that was really wonderful, Jason. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you, Fong, again. This, uh, Jason, this has been a really, really wonderful, wonderful conversation. We appreciate you taking, taking your time.
Um, so at the rail, we have, a, we have a tradition of ending all of our lunches with a poem, and we've carried that tradition on to, uh, to these events. So today I'm thrilled to welcome the poet musician Janice Lowe to the stage. Janice Lowe is a composer, pianist, poet, and the author of Leaving CLE in Swam. Her musical theater compositions include Somewhere I'd Texas and Sit In at the Five and Dine. She has composed music for plays such as Door of No Return by Nahasiau, sorry. Nahasiau. Sorry, I always went over that. It's okay. Um, and uh, arranged the music for the Montague Ring for Tracy Morris's play, Possible Man. She's the author of Leaving CLE Poems of Nomadic Dispersal. A recent Creative Capital awardee, Lowe was commissioned to compose Millie and Christine McCoy's sister's syncopated sonnets and song, and to, to Yimba Jess, sorry, Jess's. Tayimba Jess. Tayimba Jess's Aloy. Oleo, thank you. Aloy. My words, mm -hmm. they're escaping me. <laughs> she has performed in Nona Hendrix's Rock Solid Women Festival and with Ann Waldman and Fast Speaking Music. Leaving CLE Songs, the debut album of Janice Lowe and Namaroon is available on Bandcamp. She's a co-founder of the Darkroom Collective. Okay. Janice. Thank you so much. I'm so uh, honored to be here with uh, Jason and Fong and everyone who took the time today uh, to be here in community. Um, I'm going to uh, play a recording um, of a poem that I have musicalized. Uh, my way of uh, sharing poetry is to uh, play keys while I'm vocalizing. And so I'm gonna play a little bit of that today. So Cal, can I share a screen? Yes, you can okay. you have the capability. Here we go. Okay. So you'll see a photograph, the one good photograph I got from my cell phone of uh, this meeting with this uh, civil rights hero. His name is Reverend Thomas Linton. You probably don't know his name. He lived in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And uh, when he was just a kid working at the barber shop, uh, that's when the protesters would come in and he and other people working there would clean off the protesters, comfort them, um, if they had been tear gassed, uh, this kind of thing. And I was visiting in Tuscaloosa in maybe like 2012 or 2013, and a relative of mine said, I didn't, I didn't know this gentleman, a relative of mine said, um, I'm talking to Reverend Linton right now. He says you can come to the barbershop and talk to him about civil rights. I was like, oh, okay. So I go and I know that I'm gonna hear something I've never heard before. He invited me in. I didn't even have time to take physical notes. But what he dropped on me was strategy. And what he shared with me was that he didn't get to share his story enough because they have been holding the secrets for so long. And uh, I looked him up recently and I was like, I wonder how Reverend Litton is doing. He passed in May. Um, I wrote this, I um, wrote this poem a couple of years after I met him and I musicalized it right after because that's you know what happens so i'm going to play a little bit of this thank you and this is h and l express a barber beauty establishment i'm a shaving my collection pop up if you want to see me and all you got to do is tell me about swapping I'm a plain spoken, spoken confidently humble, servant of God and no man, Mr. Redman. I'm a monster of preservation.
Thank you. That's kind of like my tribute to uh, Reverend Linton. And I want to um, say the names of the musicians who play with me on that project. That was Glenn Laster, violin, Devin Braja Waldman, alto saxophone, Gregory Cage, guitar, Johan Portico, bass, Sean Banks, percussion, Howard Alper, drums, and myself on keyboards and vocals. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janice. Thank you, really. And thank you, Jason. Thank you, Fong. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. So we're, uh, we're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. So please consider making a contribution to our, to our anniversary fundraising campaign to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. Like this NSE conversation series and our special project, We the Immigrants. Every amount matters to us. So please check out the chat for more information. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Atel Adnan and Charles Bernstein. You can turn your microphone on and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thanks to Peter. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks for that awesome Thank you. poem, Janice. That was so yeah, that cool. Was awesome. oh, that, was great. Great. that was amazing, Janice. Great. What a great. What's happening? Hi. Hi, Aggie. Hey, Bob. All righty. I call you in a minute. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Fong. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Janice, you sound good. Hey, Lynn. How are you doing? Oh, boy, do I miss you. Hey, Lynn. Hey, hey. Bob. Hey. Bob. Hey. 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 How are you, Rick? Okay, everybody. Oh, Bye. look who's here. Let's Lynn. have dinner. Yeah. There she is. Much love. Much love and courage. Thank Bye. you. Yes. Thank you. Talk to you kit, soon. Kit, 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 kit. Thank you. Much love and courage, you guys. Bye. Dad, Bye. Dad, Dad.